My name is Matthew Monagle. I am the web manager here at Columbia Business School Executive Education. And today you've joined us for our webinar with Professor Joel Brockner on the process matters. A few housekeeping tips before we get started. Um, we are going to, of course, have a recording of this webinar available. We usually have those prepared in about three to five business days. So if you have to leave the call a little early or if you um, want to come back and take another look at the slides and hear some of the information presented again, keep an eye out for that. If you're on in this room, then you will be on the mailing list for those when it goes out. Um, we'll be taking questions throughout the webinar. So feel free to use the Q&A box in uh, our platform to ask any questions. We'll be addressing them specifically during the last 10 minutes, but we wanna make sure that those things, as they come to top of mind, you share them with us. So go ahead and send them as you think of them. And then if you are a social media user, if you're active on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, feel, please feel free to share your insights, your thoughts as the webinar is going on by using the CBS Exec Ed hashtag. So we are joined today by Professor Joel Brockner. Uh, professor Brockner is the Philip Hedelman Professor of Business at Columbia Business School. He is the author of The Process Matters, Engaging and Equipping People for Success, which in the past year has received awards from Strategy and Business, Axiom Business Book Awards, and the Association of American Publishers. And he takes this research and this experience uh, and brings it right to executives by teaching in our high impact leadership and leadership essential programs at executive education. He is the faculty director of both programs and he works with faculty and uh, from the business school and executives from around the world. And we're actually gonna start today with just a short clip. Um, we're gonna show you an introduction to both some of the research that Professor Brockner did and a little bit more information about the process. How come things are not done better more often? You know, one would think it's kind of a no-brainer to handle decisions, especially the tough decisions, uh, in more what I would call high-quality ways. What are the obstacles? Uh, what is it that gets in the way at the individual psychological level? What's getting in the way at an organizational level? And then what can we do to deal with those obstacles? This good mental model that we walk around with in our heads, we need to pay attention to the how, not simply to the what, actually gets translated into people's leadership and managerial behavior. Oftentimes, small differences in how things are handled can have a huge impact on how it's experienced by those on the receiving end. We need to pay attention not simply to what we decide, but how we go about planning, how we go about implementing that which we've decided to do. All right, and without further ado, I'll introduce Professor Brockner. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Matthew, and thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, really happy to be with you. Uh, and as Matt mentioned, I'm going to give a short presentation uh, about the book. Um, and as Matt mentioned, uh, the ideas that are in the book are things that we actually bring into our executive education programs. Uh, so I begin the book with the parable of Jay Leno, uh, who, as you know, was dismissed not once, but twice from uh, NBC. Uh, and I, we learn a lot from these two dismissals because uh, they basically illustrate key points you know, from the book. So you might recall, let me take you back to 2009 when Jay was first uh, dismissed. He describes how he reported to work one day and was told literally nothing by his bosses other than um, you're fired. Uh, that you'll be out of a job come, you know, a few years from now. And they re they replaced him, as you might recall, with Conan O'Brien, um, and it didn't quite work out. Well, what Jay also describes is that he was really very upset, not simply about being laid off, so to speak, but the way in which he was laid off in a very dismissive, very disrespectful manner. Uh, and as he reports, he was quite unhappy about the whole experience. Uh, as we saw, J Conan O'Brien comes in, it didn't really work out for NBC, uh, they had to bring Jay back, uh, and he stayed on board for another couple of years, and then uh, he was going to be laid off or dismissed yet again, uh, this time to be replaced by Jimmy Fallon. However, NBC learned a few things, NBC Top Brass learned a few things, uh, you know, in the interim. Uh, they were much more respectful of Jay, they thanked him profusely, uh, they were... Um, 
effusive in their praise, short conversations. Uh, and also for his part, Jimmy Fallon chimed in by being very respectful towards Jay, saying basically that if it weren't for Jay, he wouldn't be having a show you know, to take over. Uh, and this time when Jay walked away, uh, he walked away on very different terms. He felt much better about the decision. So what's interesting here is a few things. First, it was the exact same outcome. He's still being dismissed. Um, but he's having a totally different experience in response to that dismissal. So what do we learn from these two dismissals of Jay's double dismissal from NBC? One is that uh, the process matters. It's not simply what we do, but how we do it. Uh, number two, even small differences in how things were done can have a big impact on how things are experienced by those on the receiving end. Uh, so think about the difference in treatment. In, in NBC top brass from one time to the next. It didn't take a lot of time. It only took a few people, a few key people to show respect, genuine respect, you know, to, to Jay. Uh, and he had a totally different experience of his being let go, uh, which then raises kind of a puzzling question. If it seemed so obvious, if it seemed that even small differences can have such a big impact on how decisions are handled, it's puzzling as to why decisions are not handled better, you know, more often. What's getting in the way of, the, of what I would call a high quality process? And once we know what's getting in the way, can anything be done about it? So those are the three main takeaways from the uh, Jay Leno's double dismissal from NBC. Uh, so I'm going to talk briefly about when I say things should be done in a high quality way, uh, what do we mean by that? Well, different literatures and management contribute to our understanding of a high quality process. And I think it dovetails with a lot of people's kind of understanding of good common sense. Uh, so one thing we know is that a process is high quality when it is perceived to be fair. Uh, not simply that the outcome is fair, but the way in which the decision was planned and implemented was fair. Uh, and many things go into the fairness of a process. Uh, two that I'll briefly mention is one, uh, giving people a sense of voice or participation. Uh, it's only fair, after all, if a decision is going to be imposed upon people, uh, or it's going to affect people, rather, that they had some say uh, somewhere along the line, either in providing input, or maybe they had a vote at the very end. Uh, you know, but the, the more that people feel like they had some voice in the process, the fairer the process is perceived to be. A second major determinant of the fairness of the process is the behavior of the people who are planning and implementing the decision. And in particular, do they give a reasonable explanation? Do they give a reasonable explanation that's delivered in a reasonable tone of voice? Uh, and more generally, to the extent to which people feel that when decisions were made, the people who were planning and implementing the decision were treating them with dignity and respect. Another a set of principles of what we mean by high quality process can be deducted from the vast literature on bringing about change, uh, change in organizations, change in groups, change within individuals. Uh, and I, I've illustrated four points here that speak to the process being high quality. Uh, first, it's important to surface dissatisfaction with the current state. You know, it's the old saw, if people feel that things are uh, okay, then they're not going to be very motivated to change. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So people need to be convinced that things are either broken and therefore need to be changed, or if they're not broken, if they're okay as is, uh, that there's still a much better place to be, that, that there's a gap between where we are and where we need to go, even if the current state is reasonably satisfactory. Now, you have to not only talk about what's wrong or surface dissatisfaction, you have to show people a better alternative, and that better alternative is captured by the V word, vision. Uh, but even that's not enough. Uh, it's not enough simply to talk about what's wrong with the way things are and here how there's a better alternative to where things are. Uh, we need to have a process that will help move us from the dissatisfying current state you know, to the better future state. Uh, and even that's not enough. We need to recognize that people will often resist change. Uh, they experience change as costly in a variety of ways, and as a result, they'll resist it. So part of what astute change agents do is they reduce the costs of change. Another way of saying that is they find ways to lower people's resistance to change. So it's summarized in my 
conceptual, even though it looks mathematical, formula at the bottom of the page, change will happen. In other words, people will embrace rather than resist change to the extent that they feel that the driving forces that will motivate them to change, surface dissatisfaction, provide a vision of the future, have a process in place, will outweigh the restraining forces or the costs of change. Uh, and when that happens, uh, when all of the above happens, then change is likely to be embraced rather than resisted. So I'll give a couple of examples. It's one thing to talk about the DVP greater than C model. It looks kind of academic and theoretical, but not really. I'll illustrate with a few examples. So with respect to surfacing dissatisfaction with the current state, uh, an example of that would be analyzing the need for change. If you're good at that, if you have a strong ability to understand why change is necessary, then it positions you well to describe to people why the situation as it exists prior to the change is not acceptable. Uh, when people get a reasonable explanation delivered with a reasonable tone of voice, they're much more likely to get on board, in part because the information helps, but in part because of the symbolic value of the message itself. In other words, that the, the change agent cared enough to give people a reasonable explanation is a very powerful symbolic message and makes people more likely to get on board with change. I always say that if you don't have time to be a participatory manager, uh, because it does take time to go back and forth to involve people in decisions, at the very least be a good explanatory manager. It helps people to get on board. Uh, in terms of the vision piece of the DVP model, uh, you can see how I'm defining vision. Uh, and one of the good action steps uh, is reminding people of the common vision throughout the change effort. And the operative word there is remind. Uh, you need to keep people's eye on the prize. What is it that we're trying to get to? Uh, people need ongoing reminders uh, of what it, what it looks like or why we're needing to go there. Uh, because it's easy in the day in, day out work for people to lose track of what they're ultimately shooting for. So the change agent who gives different reminders of what that future state will look like uh, is doing the job in a high quality way. Uh, an example of process, um, helping people to separate from the past, uh, practices which enable people to leave behind previously successful ways of doing business that no longer work. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, uh, when, uh, when, when telling people about the need to change current practices, showing respect towards those practices that have served the organization well in the past. Why is that important? Well, when change is introduced, the message that people could infer is one of being invalidated and disrespected. Uh, the message they could infer is that what they've been doing up till now makes no sense. That's why we need to change. That's the message they could infer. And that's not the kind of message you want them to infer. Uh, because people are not going to be very motivated to go in a new direction when they feel dis in or disrespected, invalidated for their previous efforts. So the better way to go would be to show respect towards those practices that have served the organization well in the past. The message should be, what we've done up until now made a lot of sense up until now, but if we're gonna to wanna to continue to be successful, we're gonna to need to go about things in a different way. So let's honor, respect the old guard, the old way of doing things, why, we'll, why we simultaneously talk about the need to move in a new direction. And an excellent way to do that, by the way, uh, to show respect towards the, towards the past, is to use ceremony. Uh, when organizations have ceremony, what they're doing is they're essentially acknowledging transition. And in the process of acknowledging the transition with the ceremony, it has, a, has the effect of facilitating the transition. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about, again, this, the, uh, one of the other main points, mother, mother, another main takeaway from the saga of Jay Leno. Uh, again, it's the idea that a little bit can go a long way. So I described that anecdotally, that just a little bit of, of how NBC handled the dismissal uh, in time two versus time one had a major effect on how Jay experienced things. It turns out that Jay is not alone. There's been lots of research over the years which shows that a little bit can go a long way. I'll give two examples. Uh, one came from an organization that had been introducing um, a pay cut. Uh, and uh, what they found 
was that there were um, many employees who were asked to go through the, who were asked to endure this pay cut. Uh, they were stealing from the office. So it's, it's, a, it's as if they were not getting it from the office in terms of pay. So they were taking from the office in the form of theft. Uh, and many of them were looking for jobs to go elsewhere. But how much they reacted in these negative ways by stealing or by looking for a job to go elsewhere depended upon how the layoff or I should say how the uh, pay cuts were communicated. So in one case, uh, the CEO uh, spent about an hour with one group uh, explaining why the pay cuts were necessary, how he thought it would help the organization to move forward, he expressed sympathy, he gave expressed empathy for what he was imposing, what the organization was having to impose on people. Uh, but I'd call that kind of a high quality uh, process. In the other group, uh, what, what it was a much lower quality process. Uh, it was not the CEO who made the presentation. It was rather one of the underlings, a vice president. It was a much shorter presentation, about 15 minutes rather than an hour, uh, much more cursory, much less empathy, much less uh, dignified and respectful treatment. And so it's the same pay cut. But one group stole a lot more from, saw a lot more, was much more likely to be looking to leave the organization than the other. And you can pretty much guess which group reacted more negatively, the one who was treated in a less of a quality way. Uh, a little bit can go a long way. Another example from a more recent study done by uh, Cable, Gino, and, and Stats, uh, what I call onboarding in a self-affirming way. Uh, so when you first join an organization, when you onboard, a typical method used by organizations is to tell people why uh, they're, they should be so happy to be here, what the organization stands for, the values of the organization, and the like. Uh, and in the study, one group was treated in the typical way. Another group was treated in a more self-affirming way. In addition to being told everything that I just mentioned, this group was told uh, by, the, by their organization, um, what would you want to do in this organization? Here's what we stand for, but what do you stand for? What are your signature strengths? Uh, and how might you enact them on the job? Uh, now, that doesn't mean that people were given free reign to do anything they wanted. Uh, they had to still negotiate with their employees as to what they would do by way of acting on their signature strengths. So just to give you one example, uh, let's say if you're an individual who's very extroverted and you like to be in a role of teaching, uh, so this person would say, the expert would say, I li I'd like to find opportunities to be training people. Uh, I enjoy being around other people. I like teaching them, instructing them. Uh, and so whenever possible, the employer would find ways to allow people to enact their signature strengths. This whole process, pardon me, uh, this whole process took about an extra hour in the onboarding stage. But it turns out to pay huge dividends because relative to people who are not treated in this self-affirming way when they were onboarded, um, you know, those who were treated in, in a self-affirming way were much more motivated, much more productive. Uh, there was much higher customer satisfaction for the customers who were interacting with employees who were onboarded in a self-affirming way. So it only took the organization an extra hour or two and during the time that they were bringing people on board. It had a major impact on product activity and morale. So uh, let me turn to the third question that I, I suggested at the outset is illustrated by the Jay Leno double dismissal. What gets in the way? If it's such a no-brainer to do things in a high-quality way and it has such positive consequences, what gets in the way? Uh, many factors, but I'll, I'll mention just a, just a few. Sometimes it's a knowledge gap. Sometimes it's not always obvious that a little bit can go a long way. Right? Who knew that for spending, for to have uh, a an organization CEO spend a little bit of extra time and with a little bit of extra empathy that it would have such a dramatic effect on uh, theft and turnover? I mean, we think it would matter, but not to the extent that it did. The same thing. Who knew that spending a little bit of time allowing people to onboard in this self-affirming way would have such dramatic effects, dramatically positive effects uh, over a long period of time? Uh, sometimes it's not obvious. And I think having conversations like this uh, makes it more obvious and gives people an increased, I think, an, an increased appreciation for the importance of how a little bit can go a long way. Sometimes it's not so much a knowledge gap, but it's a skills gap. We might know what we need to do, but we might not necessarily have the skills necessary 
to do it. Because oftentimes when you're making the tough decisions, you're having to be the bearer of bad news, uh, you're dealing with people who are not likely to be very happy. Uh, they're gonna be angry at you. Uh, they're gonna be very anxious about what their career prospects look like. Uh, and so it requires having a cool head on the part of the person delivering the news. Uh, doesn't mean that you don't feel some discomfort yourself, but you have to have enough emotional intelligence to be able to regulate your negative emotions. And by regulate, I mean you find a way to continue to be successful, even though you as the deliverer of the bad news uh, are feeling negative emotions, but you still find a way to be constructive, you know, nonetheless. And some people just don't have the skill set to be able to do that. And as a result, they end up not delivering the bad news in as high quality way as would be optimal. Sometimes it's not a matter of skill or knowledge. Sometimes it's a lack of desire. So I know what I need to do. I have the ability to do it, but I just don't want to. Uh, for example, sometimes doing the process in a high quality way requires people to be participatory, to involve people in decisions. Some managers might feel, well, the more I involve others, the, what, the, the more I'm taking power away from myself. Or some people feel that you don't want to give an explanation because, uh, you know, the old legal motto, uh, anything you say can and will be used against you. Uh, so from those who ascribe to that school of thought, uh, information is power, you might not want to give explanations because you think it might come back to bite you. Well, again, uh, let the buyer beware, because if you don't involve people, if you don't give them explanations uh, in the service of maintaining your own power, you run the risk of a more coarse or more difficult process that makes people on the receiving end feeling much more resentful. The single biggest factor I hear though when I talk to managers in executive education programs and elsewhere is they say they don't want to spend the time. It does take time to do the process in a high quality way. Uh, and my response is, well, uh, pay now or pay later. In other words, if you don't do the process well, especially when you're delivering bad news, if you don't do the process well, you're probably going to be creating a big mess for yourself. Uh, and you're going to have to then clean up the mess later. So it's not even so much pay now or pay later. It's more the ounce of prevention being worth the pound of cure. And somehow, if managers thought about it that way, they might be able to somehow make the time in order to handle the process even the process of delivering bad news, uh, they'll just find a way to make the time for it. Okay, in the, in the few minutes that I have remaining, let me talk briefly about what we might do to deal with these, some of these obstacles that get in the way. Uh, and I'll talk very quickly through the, about these three. First, I think it's important to be able to legitimize conversation. Oftentimes, these are difficult decisions. Uh, it's the elephant in the room, and there's a sense that we can't talk about it. We just need to get through it. But yet, if we feel like it, it, stops, it starts at the top. If the CEOs or the other senior executives say, hey, we're going through a tough time, and it's okay to feel pain. It's okay to talk about what we're feeling. Uh, somehow, that makes people feel you know, significantly less bad about the otherwise tough decision. Uh, another example would be having people appraised based on not simply outcome, but on process. I teach a course at Columbia on managerial decision making. My single biggest message throughout the semester uh, is that it's important to evaluate decisions and decision makers based upon not only the outcome, but also the process. The news there is the process. We already evaluate decisions and decision makers based upon the outcome. You know, the bottom line is the end of the day, dot, dot, dot. We need to continue to do that, but we also need to evaluate decisions and decision makers based on not only what they decided and the bottom line, but also how they got there. And finally, uh, it turns out um, that when you put people through training programs on how to improve their decision-making process, for example, to be more fair in how they go about planning and implementing decisions, uh, it turns out that their employees actually are the beneficiaries of that. Uh, employees whose managers went through a training program are more motivated, more committed, more engaged, and in one recent study, they actually sleep better at night. If your boss uh, went through a training program, he's going to behave in a more respectful way, make the workplace a lot more stress-free, and as a result, employees literally sleep better at night. So we can get better at this, is, is I think the, uh, the silver lining uh, in the cloud that we sometimes see of unnecessarily harsh processes. 
So I'll stop and, and take questions. Thanks for hanging in. I know I threw a lot of information at you in a short period of time. Uh, if you have any questions after the webinar, certainly feel free to contact me uh, at the email address that you see on the screen in front of you. Joel, thank you so much. We've, uh, we've actually got a, a few good questions that came in, so I'm going to jump right into them here. Um, first and foremost, the first question that someone had is about managing in the other direction. When you're managing up or when you're trying to, to influence up as opposed to down, you know, what kind of strategies and processes should you be thinking about in order to influence your management team if you don't necessarily like the direction that your organization is going? That's a great question. Uh, and again, the process matters in all sorts of directions. Uh, so uh, in that case, um, the same, involving your boss, explaining to your boss why your position is what it is, um, recognizing, for example, in giving uh, this information to your boss, the way in which he or she would like to be communicated to, right? Some bosses like to be talked to face-to-face. -to -face. Other people will say, send me an email. Uh, so the process, even when you're managing up, also matters. Uh, and at the end of the day, you're going to need to deliver the news or make your case in a way that you think will be um, most targeted, you know, to your, you know, to your boss uh, in, the, in the ways that I just described. There's a lot more to say, but uh, you're quite, quite right to be thinking about the managing up part and the importance of process in that context as well. So we had a, an, another good question. Um, someone wanted to know specifically a, about um, if you're in an organization that has performance-driven goals, so people are used to being rewarded based on the outcomes, how can you start moving some of those, and is there a way to start moving some of those performance goals into more process-oriented thinking? Yes, there's a way. Uh, it's sometimes an uphill struggle because, as you say, if the organization is firmly entrenched in thinking about um, outcomes only, uh, then uh, you know, then how are we going to introduce the process dimension? I think part of it, it comes down to understanding what their resistance is to going in the direction of introducing the process. So, for example, sometimes I hear uh, managers say that, um, yeah, that's great, but, you know, we don't have time to concern ourselves with what, the, what, what a high-quality process looks like. Uh, or I sometimes hear them say, we don't even know what that, what that means, uh, we know when somebody succeeded or failed, we don't know what it means to uh, do the process in a high quality way. Uh, to, to which my response is, uh, especially on that second point, actually, the process is measurable. Uh, it does take time to think about what are the steps, what are the behaviors that would comprise a good process. Um, so you have to think it through. There's no way around that. Um, but I'm convinced that when people know that they're going to be appraised, uh, not only based upon the bottom line, but how they got there, uh, then uh, they're going to pay much more attention to the process. I always get nervous when managers say to their people, uh, I don't care how you get there, just get there. Uh, because sometimes when, when, the me when the message is delivered in that way, people do whatever they think is appropriate. And sometimes, by the way, that could lead to you know, unethical behavior uh, when people feel that, okay, well, boss, you don't care how I get there. I'm going to do it in whatever way I deem to be appropriate, including unethical ways. So we need to harp on this message of it's not only the outcome, but also the process. I agree that it's hard work to introduce the process dimension, but if you try to understand what the resistance is on the part of organizations, you're in a much better chance to do something to deal with those resistances. So we have time for one more question, I think. And um, we'd had someone that asked about you know, agile organizations, new organizations, startups that value flexibility and being able to kind of change things on a whim if, they, um, if they're trying to chase different results. With some of these organizations that might be newer or smaller or still trying to build a process in place, how do you get them to move from valuing the lack of a process, in essence, to actually having one in place that they think is important? Yeah, so I don't, when I use the word process, I'm not implying uh, bureaucracy, um, you know, we have to go in this direction, uh, there's a process that we need to follow, uh, because that meaning of process, again, takes us in a direction of, of, as you say, a lack of agility. So, you know, my, you know, my suggestion here is that we have to define what we mean by a high quality process, and in a startup context, uh, you know, what that would mean, as you, as you point out, is being agile. So we have to agree that whatever mechanism we put in place to make decisions, 
we also need to include ways in which we can be we can we can be se sensitive to changes in the environment uh, and then we have in place the ability to respond to those changes in the environment. So I would define a high quality process uh, in that context as one of agility, uh, as opposed to feeling like process is something that inherently has to be bureaucratic and stultifying. All right. Well, Joe, thank you so much. I think that's about all the time we have here. Um, I know there are a few more questions that are in the queue, and we're going to make sure that we collect all of those at the end of the session and actually send them over to Professor Brockner so that he can review them. We would encourage you to reach out to him directly via the email address that he's got on the screen. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more directly from him, I just wanted to highlight the fact that his Leadership Essentials Program will be running here at Columbia in April of next year, and his High Impact Leadership Program will be running in June next year here at Columbia. Um, again, we'll be sending you a full recording of this webinar that will include the, the um, visuals of the slides as well as the audio, and you should be getting that in two, three to five business days. So thanks everyone for attending, um, and thank you for all your wonderful questions, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.